So in case you don't know, there's good naked and there's bad naked. And sometimes good naked can become bad naked. Sometimes bad naked can become good naked. Sometimes two bad naked can make a good person. Sometimes two good naked can make a bad person. If you don't know what I'm talking about, which you probably don't, I'm talking about the life of King David. And um, one of the worst snapshots of momentary failure anywhere in the Bible. I'm thankful that the Bible is concluded, that God's done telling the secrets of the people who, like you and I, have made mistakes along the way. I know some think that Jesus stands with a clipboard staring at you, waiting for you to make a mistake. And the second you step out of line, puts a mark next to your name, calling you unholy and unworthy, and you're never gonna be good enough or okay again. That's just not true. All of us are born sinful, unholy and unworthy, and we've all made mistakes. None of us is born without a black mark, a check mark, an X next to our name. And we're not supposed to know how to live this life in a way that leads to freedom and to hope and to finding our purpose without a personal relationship with Jesus. And so these snapshots in scripture are given to encourage and instruct, to motivate and to show us a picture of what our lives can look like if we make choices that are consistent with an undivided heart. We've been talking about an undivided heart. We're talking about the life of King David. And for the next two weeks, this is where we'll be. King David lived a life that had a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And today we're gonna to talk about a down. Last week, we talked about an up when he fought Goliath and won a courageous heart being undivided. Today, we're gonna to talk about the importance of having a careful heart and what life looks like when we're not cautious to protect and to guard our hearts. Psalm 86, 11, to remind you as a prayer of David, where he says, teach me your way, Lord, that I might rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. An undivided heart is in fact a careful heart. And when we become careless with our hearts, then we can become unuseful or disappointing. We can miss our purpose in our relationship with God. By this point in life, David was about 50 years old. He was somewhere between 50 and 55 years old. As you know, he became king at about 30. He died at about 75. And so this was kind of right in the middle of his influence, his time of influence. He was at the height of his career. He was at a point in time where he had earned the right to take this foot off the gas a little bit. But unfortunately, um, just because you've earned the right in life to do something doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. You're gonna see a couple things in this story. One is that when David chose to take some me time, some time away to relax a little bit, to coast, it opened up um, vulnerabilities that he had been collecting throughout his entire life that he hadn't dealt with, they were exposed. You're gonna see that he was isolated from other people, from accountability. You can see that he slipped away from God's calling and his purpose. But most of all, what I want you to see today as we work through this is that regardless of the mistakes that you've made in the past, that there is forgiveness and there's a second chance and that a disciplined heart, an instructed heart is an undivided heart and the kind of heart that in fact God blesses. So we're gonna look at a story that occurred at a time when David should have been at war with his people. The king had chosen not to go to war. Now you may ask why the king should have gone to war in the first place because we protect our generals and, and admirals and high ranking military officials because we don't want them to be captured or killed because we need their brains. Well, back in the day, we talked about warfare, ancient Old Testament warfare. We talked about how people fought in a very primitive kind of way, shield walls and whatnot, where you met in open fields of combat. And basically it was just the strongest survived and the weakest died. And the kings represented uh, valor. They represented the fact that there was skin in the game, that the, that the resources of the nation was behind them. And for the children of Israel, the king being in the fight, represented that this is what God wanted them to do. And David had chosen to stay home. That was a problem. I'm gonna pick up this story at a time where David wasn't where he should have been, not doing what he should have been doing, and he wasn't with the people who he should have been around. In the spring, at the time when kings are supposed to go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, I wanna to talk to you for just a second about the king's men and how important this is and about Joab. 
Joab was David's right-hand man, and the king's men were David's group of men who were with him since before David was really David. Do you have any friends that you knew back in the day um, who know your secrets, who knew you before the, new, the you that everybody else knows, the people who knew you back when you might've been at your, well, not at your best. There was a time in David's life where he was running from Saul, where he had just found himself playing like an insane man with spit running down his beard, trying to get a foreign king to give him some solace and protection, not to take his life. And then the Bible says, then David slunk off, slinked, slank, crawled off to a cave. And the, David's father and brothers came and found him and wanted to help him uh, minister to him and hang out. The Bible also says that there were a group of people who were disgruntled, who didn't quite fit, who were sort of outcasts or outlaws in society, and that they sort of came out of the woodwork and they gathered around David and they met him in the cave and there were about 400 of them. Now of this 400, there were about 30 of them that were David's mighty men, the merry men like Robin Hood a band of people who may have been bandits and misfits who had found purpose by serving David. Within this group of 400, about 30, and many are named in the Old Testament, about 50 actually, but about any given time, there were about 30 in operation as sort of David's special forces, his Navy SEALs, his um, right-hand guys, the people that he could trust with his life. Of this 30, they usually operated in groups of three, and in groups of three, they had one that was the leader and then two that were the soldiers. And they would go out and do clandestine missions oftentimes doing things that three people could sneak in and do that a group could never sneak in and do. A group of people that were close to him, who knew him, who knew David before David was David, who knew him when he was hiding in a cave with spit dripping down his beard, having just played insane to prevent death from the hand of a foreign king. In the spring, when kings go off to war, David sent Joab, who was the leader of the 30, David's right-hand guy. Now, Joab has a checkered history. Joab has times when he made phenomenal decisions and great, gave great advice. He has times when um, he did things that you were like, my goodness, this guy didn't have any common sense at all. He seemed to do pretty well as long as somebody was telling him what to do. But whenever he acted on his own, well, it wasn't always great. But Joab was David's right-hand guy, the leader of the 30. And he went out to war with the entire Israelite army and they destroyed the Ammonites. They besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, let me show you why this is a problem. First of all, he was bored. Kings were supposed to go off to war and David chose not to go. Now the Bible tells us, and when we look at David's life, we see that David was a good king and a follower of Jesus, a follower of God, but the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that those of us who think that we are standing, that we are obedient, that we have an undivided heart, those of us who think that we're doing the right thing, that we're walking in faith, the Bible says, be careful if you think you're standing or you may fall. Now, David, I think, went through a time when he had been standing firm in faith, a time when he had been faithful to God for decades of being the person who God wanted him to be. A momentary lapse where he let his guard down, where he wasn't careful. And what stands between standing and falling is caution. And he was bored. He had allowed himself to take the foot off the gas. Many people in our lives, we work to the spot or to the point where we can take our foot off the gas. We can't wait for a time in life where we can relax and do nothing but we know that by doing nothing, it allows lots of room for the wrong kinds of things to come in. And that as long as we're breathing, that God has a plan for our lives and that none of us are ever called to do nothing and just simply relax. So he was bored. He wasn't with his army when he should have been. And he was isolated. And that's the second thing. And that's a really important thing as well. Because he sent the people who could have told him that he wasn't where he was supposed to be and he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do, he sent them away. Oftentimes you can tell the quality of your decisions by the people you keep closest to you in your life. The advice that you ask for often reflects the decisions that you make. 
Can't tell you how many times that I have seen people, friends, decide they're gonna make bad decisions. They know that they're bad decisions. So the first thing they do is cut everybody else out of their life who's going to tell them to make the right decision and only listen to the voices of the people who are going to encourage sliding down this slippery, slippery slope of self. He had sent everyone away. He was bored and he was isolated. I should ask you who's close enough to you in your life, who you trust, who if your spiritual life turned out like theirs, you would be happy, you'd be thankful, you'd be excited. Who is it you keep closest enough to you who you want to be like in their relationship with the Lord, who you really listen to? And are they close enough for you to hear them if they're cautioning you? Or have you begun to push them away? Well, number three, the Bible tells us that he was disconnected. That when they destroyed the enemies of the children of Israel, that David should at very least have gone out and inspected the battlefield, sorted out the plunder, made sure the captives were treated the way he wanted them to be treated. But in fact, he didn't even do that. And we find David having put himself in a place where he was in danger, a place where his guard was let down. And if you're a churchy like I am, if you've grown up in church and you've grown up for a lot of your life having a relationship with the Lord, this is a really important moment for us to focus. Because just simply due to the fact that we've been around church for a long time and faithful to God as best we can for a long time doesn't mean that we're exempt from a fall. In fact, sometimes it makes us more susceptible to a fall because those who aren't careful oftentimes find themselves making mistakes. Now, the mistake that we're gonna talk about is a mistake of a sexual nature, but that's not the only type of mistake that we're going to be talking about. We're talking about what happens when a person is unrestrained and undisciplined. When a person decides that they want what they want more than what, they, than what God wants for them. When a person decides that I know that God may have a plan, but my plan perhaps is a little better. In Deuteronomy, there's some instructions that are given for an Old Testament king, a king of Israel. And one of the instructions was that a king is not supposed to multiply horses. Now, I think that that's an unusual command because we don't multiply horses, but multiplying horses back in the day meant that a king is not supposed to, a king of Israel, to establish more military might than God wants them to have because then they'll choose who are their enemies and choose who are God's. The second thing that Deuteronomy says about a king in the Old Testament, the king of Israel, is they're not supposed to multiply wives. The third thing the Bible says is that a king is not supposed to multiply a lot of money and possessions for themselves because then they can become corrupt and susceptible to bribes. David did great on the first and the third, but the very next verse in scripture in 2 Samuel, after the verse that says David realized that God had blessed him for the benefit of all the people that God had brought into his life blessings and position and success, because of who he was serving, the very next verse says, but David ignored the law of the Lord, that's my paraphrase, and began to gather concubines and wives to himself. And for about 20 years, he left this little section of his life, sectioned off from his devotion to God. And he was mostly obedient, but not entirely obedient. He trusted God 90%, but not 100%. He loved most of God's law most of the time, but not all of God's law all of the time. And it isn't interesting in an ironic and tragic kind of way that a decision that David made 20 years earlier that went unchecked, uncorrected, unconfessed, 20 years later became the second most talked about popular sin in all the Bible. An unguarded strength oftentimes is a double weakness. 
And when we allow a little weakness to creep in, unchecked, it compounds over time. So David had something in his life he hadn't given to the Lord. Perhaps you do as well. He found himself in a time when he was trying to relax and take some, what he thought was well-deserved me time. He was isolated and separated from the people who would speak truth into his life and cared enough about him to anger him, if that's what it took, by telling him that he was making a mistake. He was disconnected from even the most basic things that God had called him to do. And in the next section, we're gonna see what happens. I want you to remember David's mighty men. And I want you to remember the setting because as we come back and apply this to our lives, I think it will land in a very profound and life-changing kind of way. Father, I'm excited to talk to you about this next section, but I want us to do it as friends because um, this is one that uh, we can apply in many, many different ways in our lives, but uh, one that can be personal. And I don't want for even one second for you to think that I'm talking down to you, um, with you. We sit under the authority of the word of God because the, God's word's perfect, complete, lacks nothing. And we allow it to instruct us in how we live and what we believe. This next little section of scripture was just short. I'm not gonna cover a lot of the story that you know with David and Bathsheba. We're just gonna cover really just the nitty gritty. And I just wanna tell you as we dive into this next little three verse section that it reminds me a lot of a conversation or conversations that I have with my wife. Um, Joy, we've been married 32 years and I still have a hard time sometimes tracking with her when we talk. Now, you guys probably, if you men, you probably speak, uh, lady, no problem. You understand exactly what they mean, not just what they say. I have a hard time with that. I've shared that with you before. Now we have great conversations. I just have to keep up. I'm not as smart. I don't, and, and sometimes it seems like we start the conversation in the middle. And I'll, I know that that's not always accurate, but sometimes we'll be sitting there and she'll say something that I know I should have heard the first part of. And I don't remember her ever saying, but it's just there. And so she'll say that and I'm like, okay, I must've missed it. So I'm gonna try to piece things together. And, and, and so I do my best to form the complete thought. And, and then I, I have my conclusion and then she, she says something and it's totally different. And I'll say to Joy, I'll say, that's not what you said. And she goes, yes, it is. It's exactly what I said. And I'll repeat the words that she said exactly, exactly. And, the, and, and say, this is what you told me. And I'm sure I even wrote it down. I took notes on my phone and she'll say, no, that's not what I said. And I'm going, no, it's what you said. And she says, but it's not what I meant. Now, when she says it's not what I meant, what I'm supposed to do is understand what she means and add it to what she says and divide by two and come up with a complete thought. But what she generally does to me is just say, try to keep up, Rick, because you're falling behind. In this next little section, we have um, some speculation, but we also have some things we know for sure. And so I'm gonna speculate with you and tell you what speculation and show you the things that we know for sure. In this next little section, it's like talking with a good friend, try to keep up. Here we go. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. Now, David, at this point, was tired of not being tired. You ever been like that? Some of you are exhausted right now and you can't imagine how in the world that would, tired of not being tired, are you kidding me? Um, but he was at the end of a long vacation. The cold weather had passed, it was springtime. A gentle, warm breeze blew in across his rooftop bedroom. Windows were open, covered with drapes. He'd slept as much as he could sleep, got up to wander around to try to get tired again. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now, this doesn't take a lot of translation, but I'm gonna do it anyway. When the Bible says very, it doesn't say very, very often. And when the Bible says very, the Bible means very. So this lady was a knockout. She was a stunner. She was a showstopper. She was very beautiful, listed among the, the top few most beautiful women in all of the Bible. What does she look like? Who knows? We know she was very beautiful. So far, nothing's happened. Nothing's wrong. We got good naked going on right here. No big deal. Now, some people read into Bathsheba's motives and intentions. Um, it's not up to me to question a woman's motives and intentions and to try to figure out what was going on in her brain. Um, Joy and Lori can talk to you guys about that at some point. I'm gonna talk to you about David and his responsibility and being a man and what we know for sure. 
And right now we just have a situation that probably likely occurred in a normal sort of environment, naturally occurring nudity. Here we go. He saw a woman bathing. She was very beautiful. And the problem was David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, the interesting thing here is that she's introduced by her dad's last, last name or name, which was common, but she was also introduced by her husband's name, which was uncommon. The servant was trying to give David a, a clue, a heads up about the situation. David knew. The servant was reminding David. Now, remember I told you about the mighty men, the band of 30. If you go to the end of David's life, there's a list of the names of the mighty men, the band of 30. There's only 27 names listed. As I mentioned, there were 50 total names listed in the Old Testament and 30 at any given time, most people think people died and they came and they went, but one remained the same, at least up until this incident. Uriah the Hittite was mentioned as one of David's mighty men. David knew Uriah. He fought with Uriah and Uriah knew David before David had become David back in the day when they were out running from Saul and letting spit drip down your beard. Many theologians and historians believe that the reason that Uriah had a house right next to the palace was two reasons. One, because it was a gift of honor because a, 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 valid, a, valor, a soldier of valor would have a gift like that from the king, a best friend. And it was also a place of protection. You put your people who would protect you closest to you. I happen to believe that, but that's part of the conversation that's conjecture and speculation, although I feel like there's a lot of evidence. But so far, David looked. Gentlemen, looking is not free. One of the biggest misconceptions and lies we tell ourselves is that, well, God's created beauty. It's fine if I look. It's not fine if you look. The first look can be an accident. The second look, man up, undivide the heart, and choose uncommon faith. David's first look, curiosity. His second look, sin. And it's the same for you, and it's the same for me. David sent for the woman. Well, let's go to the next slide here. And she came to him and he slept with her. Now the Bible doesn't go into detail, thankfully, but we know that obviously something happened here that wasn't appropriate. And many people feel like God is just in the business of trying to ruin your life by giving you too many restrictions and rules and regulations about your sexuality. And in reality, I believe that since God created me and he created you, since he has and he alone has the blueprint for our lives, since he and he alone know what leads to freedom and peace, fulfillment and useful service, I choose to take him at his word. And here is what he says that sex is only to be expressed between a man and a woman within the bounds of a monogamous marriage relationship. And when expressed in that way, not only is it a good thing, but it's a very good thing. And I know what society says, but I don't care what society says because society and science didn't write the blueprint for my life. God did. And it seems counterintuitive because if we don't go and try to get what we want, we feel like we're not gonna get what we need. But a person with an undivided heart and a person of uncommon faith chooses to trust that God knows what he's talking about. And for many men, this area is the very last one we give to God. And that second look is the period at the end of the sentence of our offering back to him. So David sent, she came, he slept, good naked became bad naked, right? Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David and she said, I am 
pregnant. Now, good people can come from bad relationships. Solomon came from the two of them. People who shouldn't have been together ever, David and Bathsheba. Um, bad people can come from people who should be together. David and one of his other wives, they had some sons that were terrible to David. In the genealogy of Jesus, Uriah is mentioned, Bathsheba is mentioned, and Bathsheba is mentioned as Uriah's wife, so that we know that even though mistakes are made in our lives and the lives of other people, even our ancestors, perhaps your parents or grandparents, that you don't have to be living with a curse hanging over your head, that there's redemption and that God uses tremendous things from difficult circumstances. But we have a situation. Now, you probably know if you've been around church any period of time, what happened after this. I don't have the time to talk about it today. So I'll summarize it for you. David sent for his best friend or one of his best friends and tried to get him to sleep with his own wife so he could blame the pregnancy on him. He didn't come, didn't do it. He came, but didn't do it. So David had him killed by guess who? Joab, the good, bad right hand of David. But what I wanna to talk to you about right now is what caused this to happen. Because anytime somebody who's standing like David stood, obedient to God, a man after his own heart, and fell in a way that's recorded hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years later, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and thousands, for us to be able to see and pull back the, the pages on, well, we need to take it to heart. Why not me? Why not you? Because those who think they stand, be careful or we fall. We pray the prayer of an undivided heart. From the roof, David saw and he sent. He was undisciplined. He saw something, he wanted something. In this case, it was a female, but it doesn't have to be a female. For a female, it could be a male. For a person, it could be anything anything we shouldn't have that we want, we think we deserve. He was undisciplined. She came, he slept, he took what he wanted. He was selfish. Now in this case, a sexual relationship is the object lesson of the day, but it certainly doesn't have to be a sexual relationship. It can be a purchase that you know that you shouldn't make, that's going to put you in financial bondage to where you can't give generously to the Lord, that you can't support the people around you like you want to, or perhaps even provide for your future, but you want it and so you're going to do it and you do it because you deserve it. For some, it could be a job with a promotion that causes you to spend time away from the people you're responsible for, to make compromises and sacrifices, and you look over the roof and you hear the splashing, and you've pushed the people out of your life who really need to speak into your life. You find yourself vulnerable. And so you do it because you deserve it. I had a friend in a different state offer to let me drive one of his vehicles that I really, really like. There's nothing wrong with having a nice vehicle if you could and should afford it. I can't and shouldn't have this kind of vehicle, so I don't. It was really nice, like really nice, right? So you wanna drive it? Nope. Why don't you want to drive it? I said, I don't even want to look at it. Because if I look at it, I'm going to want it. And if I want it, my credit score is probably high enough to buy it. And then if I buy it, I'm going to have to pay for it. And at some point, I'm going to wish I hadn't bought it and I'll still be paying for it. Do you get my meaning? It can be anything in life that we see, that we covet, that we think we deserve that we want and that we take. And there's always consequences. So what do we do? The heart is deceitful above all else. And beyond cure, who can understand it? Before Bathsheba, immediately before Bathsheba, David probably would have rejected this. My heart's not deceitful, my heart deserves. My heart deserves, my heart wants, my heart's earned. And so I'm gonna feed my desires because after all, I'm the king. He convinced himself that scripture itself wasn't true. 
Because that 10% of his life that he left compartmentalized for 20 years had become such an issue that it was drowning out the voices of reason. And the Bible says, my heart is deceitful above all else. Rick, you can't trust what you want. And you can't either. So there's two things we have to do to have an undivided heart. There's more, but I only have time for two. Let me say it this way. I barely have time for two. So let's move on to these two. First, our hearts must be instructed. Apply the heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. What this proverb says is that this instruction really is twofold. One is listening to God's word and, and God's law and agreeing with it. Now that brings with it some assumptions. One is that we're listening. We do this every Sunday and we do it on Wednesday nights and we try to get as much of God's word out there into my heart, into your heart as we possibly can. But listening, according to James, Jesus' brother, isn't enough that we have to actually be willing to do it. And to do it, sometimes it means we have to deny ourselves because we don't want to do it. And at the end of the day, who cares what we want if by denying what we want temporarily, we get what we need. Our heart must be instructed by listening to the word of God and choosing to do it. Number two, and this is where I really want us to spend our last couple of minutes. Our hearts must be guarded. The guarded heart. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. A guarded heart from the outside. A guarded heart means to build a fence around your life that protects you from the things that you know might ensnare you. And this is only something you can do. Build a fence. Six years ago, when I came here to pastor this church, I weighed about 50 pounds more than I do right now. I blamed it on Arkansas, living there for six years. It's Arkansas's fault. My mother-in-law, she's a great cook. But I wanted to lose a little bit of weight. Easier to move around up here on stage. I had a problem, Taco Bell. That was my problem. I wanted to run to the border all the time. I had an issue. Taco Bell's bad Mexican food. You eat it, you gotta not plan anything the rest of the day. I get it, I understand, don't judge me. But I would drive down to Oral Labor, didn't think I was hungry. I'd see the Taco Bell right there. I'd hear that bell, bing, run for the border. No, Rick, don't go to Taco Bell. But I wanna go to Taco Bell, don't go to Taco Bell. I'd have this conversation with myself. And finally, I got tired of having the conversation with myself. Listen, friends, this is important. I got tired of having the conversations with myself, so I chose to drive a different street. Some of you have to choose to drive a different street because you have had far too many conversations with yourself. You have to protect and guard your heart from the things that may ensnare you. I can't be your church police. I certainly don't want you judging and looking at every single thing that I do or Joy and I watch on Netflix or what movies we go to. We try to do what we think is honoring to the Lord. I want you to do what's honoring to the Lord. I'll help you if you need a little pointers and nudge you, but I believe the Holy Spirit can inform you. But let me just give you some principles. Some of us are very unguarded and we don't put a fence up in our lives at all. After having a granddaughter, I began to look at the world in a totally different way. Raising men was pretty easy for me. I told them to respect a woman, that their choice had to be a respectful man of God choice, that they treated a woman like a lady, like somebody's sister, like somebody's mom eventually. I held them to that standard, easy peasy. Don't know if they always did it, but that was the way I parented them. When I had a granddaughter, my heart got so sensitive to things I've never seen before. And you know, some people, we watch things on TV sometimes even with our kids that celebrate serialized adultery and that if our kids modeled the shows we watch, 
not only would it absolutely destroy our hearts as parents, but it would destroy their lives as children. And for some reason, we wonder why they make the mistakes and choices they do. Well, our hearts are deceitful, need to be instructed, need to be guarded. Mine does too. And sometimes we just have to build that fence. For some of you, it may be to cut off a relationship that's gone too far. That before you send that return text or instant message or email, you need to build a fence. Before you go to work in the morning and see the person who you've been listening to splash and you're considering in your mind what could perhaps come next. For some, maybe on the verge of making a purchase or a life choice or a move or a marriage. And you got to build that fence. You know yourself. You have to protect yourself because your heart is deceitful and so is mine. Above all else, who can trust it? Guarded from the inside. This is a fun game I play with myself and the staff play with themselves as well. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Sometimes it's important for us to tell ourselves no. I sometimes get trapped by the Instagram, you know, the algorithm that sends you things it thinks you want for you to buy just while you're sitting there, just catching up on your friends and seeing what they're doing in their lives. And just last night, I was scrolling through the Soch. Is that what you call it, Soch? Yeah, no. Scrolling through Insta, no. How far off am I? Instagram, yes. I was scrolling through social media and um, something popped up that I wanted. And I'm like, ooh, how much is this? $32, including shipping? Ooh, I can afford $32. I need this. I want this, I deserve this. Now, friends, I could afford 32 bucks. I mean, I, 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 can, I, can, I can come up with 32 bucks if I have to. I wouldn't tell Joy, I would just, I'd buy it. And, and I looked and I thought, okay, if it's the Lord's will, there'll be PayPal or Apple Pay right there. So I don't have to go find my credit card because I was laying in bed. I'll just let God decide, right? So I clicked on, put it in my cart and purchase. And sure enough, PayPal pops up. I'm like, how easy could this possibly be? The universe meant for me to have it, right? Isn't it crazy how many people just want to broadcast things into the universe and let the universe manifest things back to them? Uh-uh. And I thought, you know, I can afford it. Could I use it? Probably. Do I need it? Nope. By the way, Rick, what are you preaching on tomorrow? <laughs> Discipline. Tell yourself no. So I did. I said, uh-uh. I took it out of my cart. I didn't just minimize the window. I took it out of my cart and I went to bed. And do you know what? I woke up this morning and I didn't think about that at all until I told you the story. Well, the story in first service. I didn't wake up thinking I'd deprived myself of this $32 treasure that was gonna make my life so much better, but it seemed so important in the moment and I could afford it and it wasn't sin, it wasn't that big a deal. But by saying no in something little, it's gonna help me say no to something big. We had a lady from our church who likes to bring sweets and snacks to the staff and she brought a bunch of cinnamon rolls to church and the staff and I, pastors, we always talk about this trying to be disciplined because every area of life is connected. Physical, financial, emotional, spiritual. Disciplined in every area is important. A disciplined heart is an undivided heart. And Pastor Brandon was sitting there at his desk and the box of cinnamon rolls was right there. Everybody loves a cinnamon roll. And I was like, hey, Brandon, how many of those did you have? He said, I've been waiting for you to ask. I had a half. And I'm like, all right. Brandon, what's your plate and fork doing right there in front of your, in front of your, 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 your desk? And he said, well, I was thinking about having the other half, but I'm not going to. He said, I could, but I'm going to say no. And I'm like, right on, we could, but we're going to say no. Who cares about a cinnamon roll? Could Brandon have a cinnamon roll? He can have all of them he wants to have. It's not a sin, but he's going to tell himself no in something small so that when something big pops up down the road, he's used to being told no. So he texted me later and he said, you stayed a little longer than I thought. He said, I was totally planning on eating it as soon as you left. But listen, <laughs> He says, since you were there, I didn't do it. Now it's funny, but think about it in your own life. By bringing people into your life close to you, 
who you can say the same thing about in little things and big things is a big part of developing a successful walk of faith. You know, Dan, I probably would have done it, but I didn't do it because you were there. Do you have a friend like that? Sometimes saying no in the little things will help you say no in the big things. And the big things, man, they count. So an undivided heart is an informed heart. It's an instructed heart. It's a careful heart. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Paul used some analogies. And if you think I'm being hardcore, oh, this Christianity thing's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be easy. I'm supposed to just get saved, come to church, get good coffee. And then when I die, go to heaven. And those things are all true, except you miss the good stuff in between, which is living a life of service to the Lord, where as we grow in our faith, he continues to trust us with more and you find your purpose. And the apostle Paul uses some analogies about these about Christians. He says, we're like soldiers. We're like farmers. You ever met a lazy farmer? I've never any, I've met lots of farmers, never met one that was lazy. A slave, a runner, a boxer. And Paul's saying, let's just take it seriously because our biggest enemy is right here. It's me. Your biggest enemy is you. And what we want is an undivided heart. Let's close this out together. Teach me your way, O Lord. Instruct my heart, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness because you know who I am and what I need. Give me an undivided heart that I won't disappoint you. Father, thank you for my friends.